Chapters 13 and 14 of Life and Adventures of Jack Engel, an Autobiography by Walt Whitman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 13 The Sun, Another Character from Life, In Company with a Friend, I Visit Madame Selenius. Tom Peterson was about the cleverest, finest, manliest fellow I ever knew, and I think as true a friend at heart as young men often meet with. Tom had all the best qualities of the hero of my childish admiration, mentioned aforetime as Bill Jiggs, added to which he possessed the cultivation which results from going to school, mixing a good deal with fellows, seeing life as it is to be seen in a great city like New York, and most of all, from a warm, generous heart and a disposition to the enjoyment of life. His temper was happy and cheerful, his laugh, when he opened his mouth and showed those great white teeth, was real music that you couldn't get from fiddles or pianos. And when he laughed heartily, it was impossible not to think of the sunshine or something of that sort. Tom was a handsome dog withal and used to take the feather out of my cap a little too often for my equanimity in our acquaintance among the girls. But then he was always so good-natured about it, and not a bit vain or greedy, that one couldn't remain angry long. All my boyish confidences and troubles and revenges and speculations were known to Tom Peterson. I wonder that I haven't introduced him in this writing before. He saved my life once when I was learning to swim. I had jumped overboard like a fool on the assurance of some Johnny Ra that once in deep water I would be certain to swim to the shore when I found there was no other way of reaching it. Without Tom's efficient services then, there would never have appeared this entertaining history. We never had a fight or a quarrel together, which is a pretty strange thing for boys. It was more to my friend's credit than mine, too, when I showed anything like irritation or bad temper, he would take refuge in silence and in his own amiability. And he was amiable, without being the least bit of a coward. His tendency to peace and goodwill was part of a nature that could be brave as a lion when the occasion demanded. The Lord love you, Tom Peterson, wherever you are this day. As far as I remember, you hated nothing which he has made. What a blockhead old Peterson was to whine and mourn out his complaints over the sinful nature of this son. If a man couldn't be proud of such a son as Tom Peterson, he must be hard to please. Tom, sinful? Why, he hadn't a drop of blood in his great broad-shouldered body but so thought not Calvin the father. Especially was he horrified at Tom's intimacy with a lady, whose name he didn't know, but whose nature he felt sure, so the really grieved and unhappy old man told me, was next worst to the prince of darkness himself. For the alarmed father sought me out, knowing my friendship with Tom, and supposing I had influence over him. He sought me out, and told me that the young man was sometimes absent from home all night, and as near as could be found out, he spent his time in a splendid and seductive gambling house, kept by an old Jewess and her daughter, in great style, uptown. I really felt sorry for Peterson, although I could not promise to interfere any further than to give Tom a chance to explain the matter, if he thought fit. At the same time, I comforted the grieved man by reminding him how unlikely the story seemed. Tom was no saint, we all knew, but he had been equally free from anything like dissipation or coarse tastes. "'Have you spoken to him about these things?' I asked Calvin. "'No, not a word. I had not the heart to.' It seemed to me that this was a great pity— but I knew, from what Tom himself had told me, that the father and son took such different views of things, and I forbore to advise any further. That very evening I made it my business to see Tom, 
and we took a walk together out into a park that lay at no great distance. I opened the subject with some misgivings, and told the young man of his father's sorrow. He answered me with his natural frankness, and, as I suspected, the rumor which had come to the ears of the elder Peterson proved to be much ado about nothing. At the same time, the young man almost cried when I told him of his father's genuine distress. "'Come with me for a half an hour,' said Tom, "'and then I'll tell you all about it.' We walked up one of the avenues for nearly a mile, and then, turning round a corner, Tom stopped at a plain but elegant house, rang the bell, and was admitted. "'Tom Peterson and a friend,' said he to the inquiring look of the servant, who, after drawing chairs for us in an open space at the side of the hall, seemed to be waiting for something. The servant vanished instanter, and in a minute or two made his appearance again, and said, "'The ladies wish you to step upstairs.' We walked up and were shown into a richly furnished parlour, well carpeted, and with sofas, lounges, and gaslights, the walls ornamented with pictures, and the corners with two or three voluptuous pieces of statuary. One upon a sofa, and one upon a lounge, who should bless my sight other than Mrs. Cellini and her showy-looking black-eyed daughter, Rebecca? "'We will sit down a moment,' answered Tom to their polite invitation, "'but only for a moment, as we cannot stay.' "'That's a pity,' said Rebecca, with an unmistakably loving glance at Tom, "'for we are to have nobody here to-night, at least nobody we care for, if you go away.' "'No doubt we are precious treasures,' said Tom laughingly, "'but we can't stay more than fifteen minutes by the watch.' Mrs. Cellini spoke of Covert, whom she praised, though I thought it was with a dash of sarcasm. Rebecca bluntly expressed her opinion, interrupting her mother to that effect that he was one of the greatest scoundrels in Wall Street or its neighborhood, apparently considering that she had put the case about as strongly as the English language allowed. "'Don't abuse him,' joined in Tom." for my friend here will fight in behalf of his very shoe-strings. I disclaimed any intention of committing myself so deeply, and Tom added, Rebecca behaves like a true woman. She set her cap for the old man, and he is too cunning for her. We all laughed at this sally, and the young Jewess as much as the rest. You are mistaken there again, said she. You put the saddle on the wrong horse. "'Tell the truth now. Don't you go down to Wall Street at least once a week and try to captivate that innocent old man? And have you not lured him even into this house? Heaven only knows what you've done to him here.' Rebecca laughed heartily. "'What would you say,' cried she, "'if you knew that not one hour ago this worthy gentleman was in the very room where we are now?' "'Aha! Didn't I say so?' in this very room, making love to me, making love, I tell you. And you accepted him? Come, Tom, you are too bad. Well, tell me your answer to Covert, if this be true, and I have done. Rebecca smiled mischievously. To confess the truth, said she, I did not answer at all by word of mouth. I gave him a look kicked over a footstool, and sailed out of the room with the magnificent bang of the door behind me. So! And she rose, struck an attitude, frowned, gave Tom a good kick on the shins, and marched off with a comico-serious air as of a tragedy queen, giving the same effect with the door wherewith she had celebrated her departure from the lawyer. When Tom and I left this place and walked homeward, for that was the last we saw of the young Jewess that night, he told me all about it. My friend hadn't lived twenty-one years in the city, and grown up with the use of a pair of active legs and two tolerably sharp eyes to be a perfect Joseph, nor to remain in the snowy preservation of pastoral simplicity. Favorite as he was with all who knew him, 
he had seen nearly every phase of town life and had been though not as a habituant in all sorts of places mrs selinies was truly nothing more or less than a fashionable gambling house tom told me that if i stayed till midnight i could have found on going downstairs a magnificent suite of rooms superbly furnished and lit up and accommodated with the means for every sort of genteel gaming here visited many people of many sorts but overall as if by silent consent was thrown the thin veil of mrs or as she was more often called madame celigny's respectability and decorous housekeeping there was nothing worse than gaming and even that not so deeply and unfairly as in many places of the sort madame was fond of passing herself as the widow of an emigrant member of the french nobility but she was neither more nor less than an old jew tradeswoman rebecca was by no means the least attraction to the house although beyond presiding at the suppers which she invariably did she had very little to say to the visitors it was upon one of tom's casual visits here with a friend that the young jewess was interested in his welfare she found means to inform him of her feelings and after such a communication it was not exactly the nature of young mr peterson to pack up his valise and leave in the first boat of anything in the nature of gambling tom was perfectly innocent one reason was he had no money and another was that he hadn't learnt without advantage the lessons of the practical student whose books are the things and men here in this great metropolis tom had cut his eye teeth although he couldn't join with his father calvin in devotional performances the many nights that mr peterson complained about tom's spending away dwindled down to two and tom assured me that he had not neglected his business nor drank a glass of liquor the past three months and moreover there was not a straw beyond what he now told me as to rebecca he wound up while i cannot feel indifferent to her still you need not think i am in love at least not yet the woman i love must be but never mind what the night is late and the best move we can make is for each to get himself to his virtuous bed chapter fourteen retrospective what i learn on another visit to covert's house i return to the office and get a letter how the time rolled on the summer was nearly over when the engagement was made to go and see wigglesworth as mentioned in chapter thirteen and I had been the better part of two years with Covert. I had passed Cape 21 in the meantime, and was now legally a man. Violet, the good soul, celebrated the event by a grand supper, to which came Tom Peterson and seven or eight of my more intimate cronies, and you may be sure that I did not forget Wigglesworth, although the latter was quite infirm, nor the progressive Nathaniel, nor Jack either. Wigglesworth, poor fellow, insisted upon repenting for his sins, but still he had been at the supper and was persuaded into having a good time. I saw less of Inez than formerly, for she had taken up her permanent abode in half of Mrs. Fox's cottage at Hoboken, where she amused herself with a garden and Nancy's children, of whom she was fond still i found time to make her an occasional visit and whenever i went of a sunday afternoon which was my most frequent period of leisure i was sure to bring home for violet a huge bouquet the source of which i made a great mystery of and hence it came that ephraim let off many jokes at which nobody laughed more heartily than himself my good parents all this while had jogged on happily together neither poor nor rich, although Ephraim had found it necessary to increase and enlarge his business, and the old milk depot was now transformed into quite an extensive provision or grocery store, doing a good business and bringing to us all a very fair income. 
Violet continued to help her husband about the store, for she would have it so, and could never, she said, be contented, unless she had something stirring and lively to employ her mind and body about. The excellent couple, how really and how simply they enjoyed life. With all their industry, they had a wise way of never getting excited, nor overworking themselves, nor crying over spilt milk, or as Ephraim professionally used to say, sour milk. As for me, what little I had picked up of law was not of much account. The lapse of time had never reconciled me to the profession, although incidents and acquaintance and excitement, such as we in New York can easily meet with, diverted my attention from the despondency that had began to come upon me when I had been a student for the first few weeks. Inez, too, had a share in rousing my gaiety, and the vivacity that always resides in young veins. My feelings toward the Spaniard could not be called by any means a profound love, at least so it seemed to me, for the only test I could imagine gave that supposition a denial. I imagined how I should feel if Inez were to leave the city and never return, and much as I liked the girl, I felt that her departure wouldn't break my heart. So I have picked up some threads of my story that had fallen away, and find myself at the morning of the day where I was to go that night and see Wigglesworth. I had made an engagement to that effect, it will be remembered, two evenings before. This day was quite a day in my fortunes. First of all, a discovery. Could I mistake those affectionate eyes and the nimble fingers that had tied the handkerchief around poor Biljig's broken head? There, too, was the very same placid expression and the goodness of heart and the willingness to oblige. Covert had been kept home by illness, and Wigglesworth being also absent, an unusual thing for him, I was under the necessity of going up to the lawyer's house several times. One of these times, in the room where I had to wait a while, there was an old portrait of a lady that seemed to me like one I had seen in a dream. It was a Quakeress, with a neat cap and neckerchief, painted with the manner of looking at you, which gives such vividness to a really good portrait. A long, long time this picture riveted my attention, and then the truth came upon me like a flash of light. That elderly lady, was it anyone in the world but the hospitable nurse and helper of myself and my poor wounded friend in the early times of vagabondism? There could be no mistaking it. And now, like another flash, came upon my mind the looks of the young woman who had opened the door for me the night of the electioneering meeting, and whose face was then such a puzzle to me. She was the little girl of years before, remembered so well for a long time, indeed never forgotten, the little girl of the basement and the handkerchief. If there were really anything in those hints of Wigglesworth, this, too, must be the orphan to whom he alluded. The whole affair assumed an interest, and I determined to seize the first chance of making the acquaintance of the young Quakeress. I already knew that her name was Martha. Fortune favored me, for Martha came into the room with her sewing basket, and telling me that Mr. Covert wished me to wait till he finished writing some papers, which I was to take back to the office, she sat down, with one of those commonplace remarks about the weather, which are so often made in default of other conversational material. "'Whose portrait is that?' I asked. "'That is a lady thee has never seen,' said Martha. "'It is the portrait of Mrs. Covert, who died three years ago. "'I have reason to remember it. "'She was a second mother to me, "'and with her I passed as a child many happy years.' You are mistaken about my never having seen her, and it is a good likeness. The young woman looked up astonished, and without more ado, I gave a rapid sketch of the scene in the basement, and asked her if she did not remember it. 
Yes, she remembered it quite well. And was it thy wounded head I bound? No, it was the other little loafer. Ah, yes, I remember there were two boys. Mrs. Covert and I often spoke of thee and thy friend afterward. Martha's countenance grew animated, and we talked of the good lady a while. She had been the owner of some little property, and that, advanced in life as she was, must have been her fascination to Covert. As Martha talked, the glow of feeling lit up her features, and she looked really beautiful. At the same time, there were traces of melancholy and lassitude about her, which I felt sorry to see. She avoided any reference to her father, except to tell me that her earliest childhood was passed with Mrs. Covert, both parents having died when she was but a year or two old, and of the latter she appeared to wish no inquiries about them. I saw that there was something connected with their history which made her withdraw from making any talk on the subject, for Martha's face, to a very remarkable degree, was an almost provoking index to her heart and nature. It seemed, after all, strangers that we were until this moment, that we were not strangers either, in fact, but old acquaintances. We fell at once into the friendly talk of persons who had that relation to each other. Martha told me that Covert was her guardian, that after her parents' death she was taken altogether to his house, where she had lived agreeably with the old lady, the only absence being that she spent four years at a girls' boarding school. She spoke feelingly of Mrs. Covert's death, which had been a great trial to her. That she was not happy here now, whatever might have been the case, I was convinced, from her demeanor and mode of answering my half-interrogation that way, for I had got so interested that I almost asked her. The door opened, and there, looking yellower than ever, stood Mr. Covert in his dressing gown. He paused a moment, his eyes bent hard at us, and when he spoke there was more agitation, perhaps anger, in his tones than was usual for him. "'What have thee two to do or say together?' Astonished at such abruptness, Martha dropped her work and looked at him in surprise. For my part, it was only because the man was so unmistakably ill that I refrained from giving him a very summary reply. "'Go, Martha,' he said, "'and, young man, I tell thee, there is good reason why thee should not be so friendly here.' Martha rose hurriedly, and as she went out, I saw the unsuppressed tears falling rapidly from her eyes. "'You are pleased to talk in a manner I cannot understand, sir,' said I, angrily. "'Doubtless, doubtless,' he answered, sitting down, for he seemed to grow faint. "'But thee can at least understand that I do not wish any intimacy between Martha and thee.' His eyes were bright with passion. Was it for me to bandy words with this sick man, and upon something it seemed as though we neither of us knew what we were talking about? I took the papers I had been waiting for and left the house. I stopped by the way for an hour or more to see Tom Peterson. Tom was by trade a machinist, and, young as he was, had arrived at the station of foreman in a large, thrifty establishment whose proprietors thought a good deal of him and trusted him more than any one else in their employ. Was it not that this manly trade had something to do in forming my friend's character? I had a notion that way, and a vague feeling of the story it was that had caused a good deal of my repugnance to the law. Tom had gone to his trade eight years before from his own choice, and he was now considered as thorough a workman as any in the land. He got good wages, and, as it was well understood that such a man as he could not be picked up everywhere, my friend was very independent, and demanded of the wealthy gentleman who hired him the same civility toward himself which he invariably used toward them. You see, I like to talk about Tom Peterson, and, reader, 
It would have done you good had you known him. He was such a fine specimen of a young American mechanic. I told my friend of my visit to Covert's house and of Martha and the lawyer's indignation. "'He's a bad man,' rejoined Tom bluntly. "'And I'll tell you what, Jack, although it's none of my business, if I was you, I'd cut loose from him and his affairs as soon as possible. Rebecca Seligny is the sharpest woman to understand a fellow's character that I ever saw, and she despises him. Why, the fellow, as sanctified as he looks, is carnal enough, according to her story. She is mad at the sound of his name. "'She likes you better,' said I, waggishly. "'Could she show a better sign of taste and judgment?' responded Tom. "'But don't let us say anything more about Rebecca. "'I expect we shall quarrel soon, for the dear girl is very exacting.' "'Tom's advice was not so much different from my own feelings "'as to make me think no further about it. "'And I had now begun to feel enough interested in Martha "'to want to know something more.' Nathaniel and his dogs stopped from their exercise. They had been commemorating the absence of all hands from business by running races up and down the walk in front. They stopped and came upstairs with me when I reached the office. "'You return in good time, Don Caesar,' said Nat, "'for a messenger from the princess has just left this for you.' He gave me a note. I thought the boy was fooling and tossed it back to him but he grew serious and told me that it was brought but a moment before by a little darky who, in answer to Nat's inquisitiveness, could only say that it was given to him by a young lady with a shilling to bring it down as addressed. I opened it and read as follows. I write this immediately on your departure. This is no time to stand on ceremony, and I will follow the impulse of my heart. Alas, I have so few friends that it will not do for me to lose the chance of one, although I may seem immodest in writing so. Few? Where, indeed, have I any? I am unhappy here, to a degree which I will not undertake to narrate upon paper. I was much interested in your description of your adopted parents, Ephraim Foster and the good Violet. I wish to know them. I wish to speak with them. I have not time to continue my discordant note, but come at once to the point. Will you, for I must ask it, will you, unless you hear from me again, call for me tomorrow evening and show me to Foster's house and introduce me to him and his wife? You will then learn the reason of my singular request. M. At dinner time, I showed this note to Violet and prepared her for the visit. Her motherly heart always warmed toward those who had fallen in distress, and it was plain that poor Martha was suffering under troubles of no ordinary character. End of chapter 14 Chapters 15 and 16 of Life and Adventures of Jack Engel, an autobiography by Walt Whitman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 15. A Strange History Revealed. Mr. Covert's Conduct Accounted For. I could only sit and listen without saying a word, then, for such a web of villainy and romance quite took away my breath. Was my mind under the influence of no dream? Had I not been overpowered with some work of fiction? No. I looked deliberately about the little attic bedroom, and there was the high window, and on another side Wigglesworth's lank bed, with its check coverlid, and nearby the antiquated washstand, and the table by which we sat, and on which lay a package of manuscript, and leaning against the wall in an odd chair, and all lit up by the lamp giving its flickering light. And there in the kind of seat called a Boston rocker sat poor old Wigglesworth himself. Although he had been out that afternoon towards dark, and had a long interview with Martha, it was more than he ought to have done. I was quite shocked with the ghastly appearance of the poor old man, 
and his lurid and bloodshot eyes. He could not be long for this world. Indeed, he told me he didn't think he should have lived till the present hour, except that he thought he had one work to perform, and he couldn't rest in peace if it was not done. "'I tell you, Jack,' he said excitedly, "'this is all that has kept me up for a long while past. As for my body, it gave out months ago. It is dead, I tell you. You can see that for yourself.' "'Poor creature. You did look more like a corpse that moment than a living being.' The mind, Jack, the old man went on, I never before thought it had such wonderful power. But I resolved to live until I had unraveled the web of deviltry, which, as I have told you, I providentially got the clue of. I determined that I would last till this revelation could be made, was made, and now, oh, my God, I thank thee. He motioned to me to hand him a glass of water from the stand. When he had taken it, he continued, You will know without my telling you that I soon after my engagement in his office found out Covert to be a villain. I knew, too, that he had, as Martha's guardian, control over quite an extensive property, but, bad as he was at heart, I did not until lately believe him so utterly vile as not only to defraud her of her inheritance, but to make that friendless girl a victim to his licentious passions. I started, and now, ah, I began to see the meaning of Martha's note and its hidden allusions. Wigglesworth went on. Martha's affairs involve a peculiar history extending many years back. The package on the table there was written by her father, written in prison, where he was confined for a terrible crime done in the heat of passion. That crime, with his imprisonment and his death, could not but exercise a gloomy effect upon her, although she was an infant when they occurred. Poor girl! The more I have learned, the more I am interested about her, and this afternoon's interview with her decided me to unburden the whole matter without any reserve to you. It was for the better understanding of it all that Martha gave me her father's story, prepared by himself, which reached her from a trusty source some time since, and which she has kept unknown to Covert. Take this packet, then, Jack but do not read it until you have leisure to weigh well what you read. Some evening let it be when you are alone, for there is weighty stuff in it. And though you already know the particulars which are contained in it, you have perhaps a right to hear the witness of him who made you fatherless and to know how deeply he repented and suffered for it. Truly it was more like a romance than sober life, in a dwelling in one of the streets of this matter-of-fact city, and after I had buttoned the manuscript in my breast pocket, I had to thump there from time to time to convince myself that I was really awake. As I rose to bid him good night, Wigglesworth took my hand between his, and I felt those feeble palms thin and cold. Jack, said he, do not think I wander in my thoughts, but I know that I have not many days, perhaps many hours more to live. I have left some few directions with the landlord who keeps this place. He is an honest man whom I have known for years, and I am sure he will obey them faithfully. 
you will think me something of an aristocrat, Jack, but I wish to be buried in my mother's vault. She was of the old English stock, the early ones here, Jack, in Trinity Churchyard. That will cost money, too, as the city regulations are now, but I have long provided for that, and my landlord, who knows my wish, is my banker. You shall go with my old friend, probably, indeed, none but you two, and see that my shattered hulk is put away there according to my wish, will you not, Jack? I strove, although it went somewhat against the grain, for I felt a profound sadness. I strove to answer in a cheerful manner, and told him that we might have many a pleasant supper together yet, and that he would get over his illness and come out a new man. The old clerk made no response, for he saw that my cheerfulness was labored. That chilling, feeble pressure of his thin, pulseless hands at parting. It sends a palsy through me as I remember it now. Only when I got out in the cool open air and slowly, very slowly took my way home did the information I had gathered that evening take consistent form and shape, and spread out before me in a manner that I could realize, and bring it home to myself as a tangible history. To myself, yes, it concerned me, as nearly as the young Quakeress, of whom Covert was the guardian. Strange that our interests were, after all, so closely connected together, and not only our interests, but our very lives— bound by a doubly solemn tie. Yes, myself. From what Wigglesworth had gathered, I at last knew of myself. The old man had been indefatigable, and truly, as he said, for the last few months, had lived but for hardly any other purpose than to investigate and make plain the mystery. He had even, by dint of the closest inquiry, going backward over many years, sought out the whereabouts and particulars of the strange visitors who years before boarded with Calvin Peterson, and whose visit to Ephraim's and real or apparent knowledge of me and my origin I have mentioned in a former chapter. This man, Wigglesworth, pursued the track of. He discovered the place to which he sailed, and that he had settled there, and was living there yet. The old clerk entered into correspondence with him, and his information corroborated what he had before suspected. In many other ways, in every way, by examining the records of courts, by retrospective searches in every quarter, the ardent old man had come to such a state of certainty as to leave no room for doubt or disbelief. Moreover, accompanying the manuscript which he gave me were papers that fortified to a point of positive proof every point of the following strange narrative. Martha's father was a young man of what the followers of Penn calls the world's people. It was only her mother who belonged to the Quaker sect. The match, however, was one altogether for love. They had no other child but the little girl. They were possessed of very considerable wealth and lived in comfortable style, in a house he owned just near enough to the great metropolis to give him all the advantages of its luxuries and its intellectual enjoyments, and just far enough away for him to possess the pleasures of country freedom and space. For the husband was a man of some literary taste, and young as he was, he had seen much of the world, having traveled both abroad and in America. Like the blast of death, or the trumpet of the destroying angel, there came, in the twinkling of an eye, something that destroyed at once all these blessings, present and in perspective. A horrible occurrence, none the less deadly in its consequences, because it was partly the result of one of those fearful and accidental liabilities to which any man or family might be subject, came to wither the happiness of a loving husband and wife, and have a future effect on a beautiful and innocent child, the husband and wife bent to the destructive blow, and lifted not their heads from the ground, in which they sought nothing better than quiet graves. 
The child was too young to feel the horror that overwhelmed her parents. She grew up under other fostering care, into the beautiful and tender-natured, but still bold and energetic, Martha. The fearful thing was that the husband, in a moment of excessive irritation, struck one of his workmen, who had somehow offended him, a deadly blow on the head. It caused death, and that death by a coincidence that made my blood chill was none other than the death of my own father. Again I had to connect in my mind, link by link, the inevitable chain of evidence that Wigglesworth had gathered before I could believe anything so much like romance. The murderer was arrested, put in confinement, and in due time arrived the day appointed for his trial. But that day he never saw. He was in prison but a few hours when his young wife, overwhelmed with these dismal misfortunes, died of a broken heart. And after that he sank slowly but surely into decay and only asked to be buried by her side. Yet during the days before his death, his mind, which seemed to have been of great natural resolution, did not fail him. He arranged his worldly affairs with great circumspection, drew up most of his own papers under legal advice, and had them properly certified and recorded. He made his will, in which he did not forget the offspring of the poor workman, his victim. It is useless to deny that I both look upon the slain man and feel toward him nothing more than as I would look upon the same gloomy fate befalling a stranger. And is it wonderful that it is so? He was indeed, though my parent, really a stranger. Our feelings are the creatures of association and education, and even while my brain felt the shock, through sympathy, that must have followed all those events, I thought of them more as a listener to the story than as one having any special point of interest that came home pointedly to me. And, reader, that is the way I feel about it to this day. I will have the merit of candor, if I have not of sensitive feelings. The day appointed for the trial found the accused man before a higher tribunal than any here on earth. It was the day on which he was buried by the side of his wife, and then the affair, which had been much talked about, and will even now be remembered by some, perhaps, who read these lines, dropped away gradually from the public mind. It so happened that the principal legal adviser for Martha's father, during the few weeks of his imprisonment, was covert, then just commencing the practice of the profession. He so wrought upon the young man's mind, distracted with his condition, as to be appointed guardian of his infant daughter, and to get the general control of his estate. Although the father was prudent enough to put certain checks on Covert's movements, and effect, to some extent, a superior control over that cunning villain, the main object of which had been for many years on the part of the lawyer, to circumvent and get out of the way. Calvin Peterson's pious boarder, who had come to see me at Ephraim's, was my father's brother. One of his answers to Wigglesworth stated that my mother's death took place a year or two before my father was killed, and that I was their only child. By the copies of documents which Wigglesworth put me in possession of, it appeared that the will of Martha's father directed the settlement of one-third of his fortune upon the offspring of, as he termed it, his victim. This item, and the specific directions regarding it, appeared to have been prepared and recorded with all the forethought which characterized the arrangement of his other affairs. Covert, undoubtedly, at some pains and care to himself, kept this point a secret, for he was made thoroughly aware of the wishes of that unfortunate gentleman, and of the fact that the slain workman had a little child, who would be turned loose upon the world uncared for. That he wished the sole management of the property, 
intending it should eventually come into his own hands, was enough to make him lie low in the beginning. It was also enough afterwards when he learned, as he did learn, that the little lost waif had turned up in the student of his own office to make him continue the game of deceit and false-facedness. Undoubtedly, after my father's death, for I was too little to remember anything at all about it, I had been turned from door to door, in some way escaping the cold charities of the almshouse, as it was, it seems, not absolutely without the power of locomotion. But I have already treated to a sufficient degree on that part of my history, and if there is anything more wanting, the reader must supply it from his or her imagination. CHAPTER Sixteen. WHAT WAS DETERMINED ON IN A FAMILY COUNCIL The next day, which was Sunday, like a fellow who is burdened with more than he can carry, I took Tom Peterson into my confidence and told him the whole of events and revelations of the night before. Tom opened his eyes when he found out that I was really serious. I had already imparted all of them to Violet and Ephraim, who were confounded beyond measure, and wished to reflect the whole day before concluding what course to take. It was a pleasant Sunday forenoon, and Tom and I crossed the North River to Hoboken, and strolled along to Inez Cottage. A sudden thought seized me, as I saw the happy and lovely appearance of that little dwelling, where the joint labors of Inez, Nancy, and four or five out of the eight little foxes had caused vines to bloom and pleasant shrubbery with some late flowers that were quite gay even at this advanced season. Nancy herself was out there in front and welcomed me and told me to go up at once in the second story and make myself and my friend at home in Inez's sitting-room. Verily, this was a day of telling news and making confidants, for I again went over the whole history of Martha to the dancing girl, and asked her whether, in case it was necessary, she would take the Quakeress under her protection and hospitality for a short time. "'That I will,' she said with spirit, "'and if Mr. Covert dare set his foot here against the young woman's will, Nancy and I will salute him with such a reception that he won't forget us years to come.' I told Inez that I might require her to make her words good, and that, if so, I would give her due warning. She told me not to be afraid of calling in her assistance, and that she only wanted a good chance to take a little revenge on Covert for his intentions toward her spare cash. It seemed that it was somewhat as I suspected when Inez came down to the office many months before. The shrewd Spaniard, from some cause or other, had her suspicions aroused, waited a few weeks before purchasing the stock which Covert recommended, and in which Ferris was interested, and then a few weeks longer, and then had the satisfaction to read in the papers how the whole edifice, stock, and all of Mr. Pepperidge Ferris's wonderful company had tumbled to the ground, and how luckily her dollars just escaped. You may be sure the meddlesome Spaniard had fire enough in her veins to resent the deliberate design of cheating her, almost as much if it had been successfully accomplished, for that it was a deliberate design there could be no dispute. Even Mr. J. Fitzmore Smythe came in for his share of the high-strung girl's displeasure, and at his next visit Inez saluted him with such a voluble and fiery tongue that this genteel and taciturn individual was fain to put his fingers in his ears and beat a retreat in double-quick time. That he had received his walking papers, however, was a work of special grace to me. I by no means mourned his absence from Inez's rooms when I visited there, considering in such cases that two made such a pleasanter party than three. When we returned to New York... I bespoke the services of Tom Peterson, too, for I had a scheme in my head. Tom promised to do anything for me, 
from tossing covert out of his own window to holding the light while I wrote him a challenge. When Martha that night, under my charge, according to the request made in her note, left Covert's house, he was confined to his room yet, fortunately, I felt that it would perhaps be better for her to go back no more. She was now free from the wretch's premises, and why should she place herself in his power again? I proposed this in full family council, and it was considered favorably, until Martha herself put the negative on it. She said that it was her intention to leave, but not tonight. She knew, too, that she would be under the necessity of leaving clandestinely, for Covert had all the restlessness and suspicion of a guilty mind. An additional reason was that there were sundry articles and some important documents which she must take away with her when she did go. For Covert had not all the cunning of the game on his side, Wigglesworth and the young Quakeress, during the three days past, had made some master moves, and, deep as I knew the lawyer to be, it seemed, when I heard all, that they were likely to countermine him. Above all, they had the advantage of working unknown to him. Little did the scamp suspect that, all the while while he was tied there to his bedside, the girl whom he looked upon as his helpless victim and whom the disgusting brute intended as his victim in a double sense, was quietly, with the invaluable help of his clerk, who knew more about his affairs than any other person, was quietly, I say, digging the very ground from under his feet. It had been the lawyer's policy, by slow degrees, to get the property which was left by Martha's father, to be made use of as directed in his will, this property it was Covert's design, steadily pursued year after year, to get transformed into paper representatives, such as government or state bonds, certificates of deposit, and so forth. Indeed, it was the persevering and mysterious course of this proceeding that aroused Wigglesworth's first suspicions. He knew that the property belonged to Martha, that it was first well and reliably invested, and that, in being sold, it was frequently sacrificed, and a loss suffered on the second purchase without any gain. As to Martha, she was ignorant of business, and without knowing why or wherefore, signed almost every paper that Covert presented to her. The best and most important move of all was that Wigglesworth had made use of his knowledge of Covert's affairs to give Martha such instructions and such a description of the papers, her name was specified in every one of them where a name was necessary, and they were undeniably hers, that she had found out where the lawyer kept them in his house, and was prepared to pounce upon and take possession of them when she got a good opportunity and bear them off. A woman and a lawyer's clerk, have they not some sharpness? All these things being discussed in the family council, it was determined that there was no time to be lost. Covert might discover the plans that were making headway against his vile machinations, and use his lawyer tricks in such a way to stop us all off. We decided, therefore, that Martha should leave his house for good the next night. Violet and Ephraim would willingly have had her take up her abode with them, but it was thought best instead to accept the offer of Inez, which I mentioned, and whom I promised to notify the next day. These points were conned over and decided in short meter, for Martha was to be home again at nine o'clock. When I waited upon her back, I told her I hoped she would not be discouraged nor fail me at the appointed time, which we purposely put at midnight for greater security." The stout-hearted girl assured me that if she were living it should be as we planned it out, unless our plans failed by means other than any that depended on her. My sleep was disturbed that night by Martha's fortunes, and I half-dreamed of the homicide in which our two different parents had played so sad a part. I forgot to say that Martha herself had not yet learned of my being the son of her father's victim. I had charged Ephraim and Violet to be careful of mentioning this to her. 
Wigglesworth, I knew, would not. Among the first things I attended to, next forenoon, were the dispatching of a note to Inez by a trusty hand, and then calling on Tom Peterson, whose help I engaged in a way that we shall understand by and by. I asked Nathaniel if I could have his assistance that evening in carrying off a princess from a tormenting monster. The young gentleman informed me that whatever man dared, he would dare. I told him I was serious. As for him, he but loved too well anything in the shape of an adventure, especially if it was to be on my responsibility. I would have felt some qualms about stealing Martha away in this manner if I hadn't been so sure that subtlety must be opposed to subtlety, and that, if Covert had anything like open and premature defiance, he would in all likelihood outwit us all. But once safely away, Martha in possession of the aforementioned valuable papers and bonds, I felt that we could make a stout fight against him. Besides, I had the array of documents, and an index of scores more to prove, if the event needed, the thoroughness and veracity of my narration. These Wigglesworth had given me the evening of our memorable interview. Poor old man! I stepped up a moment to see him. He lay on his narrow bed, without uttering a word, and looking wan and wasted to a skeleton, but still with an expression of peace in his countenance. I bid him a mental farewell, for I doubted whether I should ever see him alive again. End of chapter 16 Chapters 17 and 18 of Life and Adventures of Jack Engel, an autobiography by Walt Whitman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 17 An Escape Attempted and what happened during the same. The appointed hour arrived, and there I was, ready, ready and away with my prize. Martha, I saw by the flashing of a lamp as we passed, looked as pale as ashes, but there could be no mistaking the resolution amounting to sternness in her eyes. Her compressed lips, too, and that whole expression of her features, were so unusual as to give her an appearance I had never remarked in her before. Could the gentle Quaker girl, indeed, have all this time contained such elements of spirit and promptitude? I had not understood her properly, that was certain. Nat hurried to us from the corner nearby where he had been waiting. He had his dog Jack with him, and the two, with a certain activity, were more quiet than usual for them. "'Mr. Peterson and I have got the boat waiting,' said Nat, "'and we'll soon row you over. "'As for that, if it were necessary, "'I could take a hand myself, "'thanks to the practice which most New York boys "'get along her docks and shores. "'Nat told us that he had almost given us up "'and was just on the point of departure. "'He supposed that some unforeseen obstacle intervened "'and Martha's flight had been postponed "'to a more convenient season.' Martha's bundle, I gave it to Nat with a great caution of its importance. We hurried rapidly along the streets, Martha holding to my arm, though she needed little support, for the brave girl felt in this emergency of her life, as she afterward told me, fully capable of tracking her own part, even should some still more eventful crisis occur, and should she become deprived of my support. Nat, carrying the parcel which Martha had brought away, was the only cause I had for disturbance. Our quick steps, and a certain flutter which could not be avoided in our demeanor, joined with this parcel, I feared, might arouse the inquisitive suspicions of the watchman. I at first thought of directing Nat to keep some distance behind us, but as we didn't know exactly the locality of the dock where, as he informed us, the boat lay, and, indeed, as we took our course from street to street, and hurriedly around corner after corner, without settled plan, there was no other way than to stick together and ruin our chances. "'What is your hurry, neighbors?' saluted our ears, as a watchman stepped out from the doorway of a corner grocery we were wending by. 
I looked him as coolly as I could in the face, asked him what he meant by stopping us in that manner. No offense, said he, only I always try to do my duty. Well, what has your duty to do with us? Perhaps nothing, and then again perhaps something, was his answer. I suppressed my annoyance as well as I could when Martha, with woman's instinct, remarked with quiet tone, Now, friend, do not prevent us, but take this shilling and refresh thyself with some coffee, and let us go on our way peaceably. The gentle voice of Martha, whose manner showed her to be so different from what the guardian of the night no doubt supposed, reassured him probably more than the coin, and he said he did not mean any harm, but he had to look out and do his duty. We hurried on as before, and were within a couple of squares of the river, when we were suddenly stopped from behind by two watchmen, one of whom laid a hand firmly on my shoulder. "'What's your hurry this dark night?' he said coolly. I didn't like his tone at all. If there be anything in a man's voice to judge his intentions by, he was a different fellow from the one whose good offices we had escaped a few minutes before. Besides, there were two of them, and, in such case, a little gratuity was not likely to have any effect. "'What have you in that bundle?' said he to Nat. I felt Martha's arm tremble a little, but she answered distinctly, the young man carries some clothing and other things that belong to me. "'Are you sure they have always belonged to you?' said he. "'Perfectly sure,' said Martha, with a self-possession that fully equaled that of her interrogator. "'And what is your name?' he asked again. Martha made no answer to this question, and there was a pause, which I felt to be an awkward one. "'That can be of little consequence,' said I and you must excuse her from answering your question. There's no harm or disgrace in honest men, or women either, telling their names, said he, peering sharply into Martha's face. She stood his look without wincing, but still made no reply. Ladies do not care about such avowals to all people, honest and delicate as they may be, said I, for want of something better to say but I will cheerfully give you my address. He took the parcel from Nat, although that young gentleman showed signs of a somewhat pugnacious spirit and refused at first to give it up, preferring, as he said, to keep it in his own possession until demanded by some authority having a proper right. But I signed him to make no opposition, as I suppose the officer wished to see if there were any special evidences wherefrom he might come at once to some judgment on the good or bad ground of his suspicions. The bundle had been put up in haste, and so far went to justify an interference unfortunate to us. But it appeared to satisfy him that it contained no articles of weight, and he, after balancing it a moment in his hands, the feeling of it, and turning it over, returned it to Nathaniel. The boy took it angrily, and favored him with a scowl which would have been appropriate enough in deep tragedy. The watchman, however, paid not the smallest attention to the angry youngster. "'Remain a moment just as you are,' said he, and stepped a couple of paces aside and conferred with his companion. We felt that it would not be safe to pursue any other course than the one which was forced upon us. Martha and I, in a subdued voice, argued the feasibility of bribing them or attempting it, but there was more danger than chance of success in that, and we relinquished it. The one who had first spoken then stepped back, the silent gentleman appearing to leave everything to the direction of the other. "'You are probably very honest people,' said he, "'and as good as I am myself. But I think it best for you to go with me to the police quarters on the next block.' You will not, I think, have to stay more than a few minutes. At least I hope so. I commenced to remonstrate with him, but he was firm. There was nothing left us but to follow his orders. Even now, although the circumstances would seem to be enough to try the temper of a strong-minded man, I could see no signs of alarm or disturbance on Martha's part. She clung a little closer to me, but her look was as composed and her walk just as even and self-reliant as before. Master Nat, however, 
did not by any means take it so philosophically. He denied going at all, and there seemed some chance of a disturbance, for the officers turned sternly to him and one of them raised his arm. Jack growled and erected the hair of his neck. A moment more and there would probably have been a fight, for when Nat's blood was up and Jack's too, they would have made battle with St. George's dragon himself. What? said Martha, stepping to the boy, and as she stood between him and the constable, laying her hand on his shoulder, thee will not desert us now, when we want thy help the most. It was enough. The premeditated tempest was quelled. Nat picked up the parcel from where it dropped on the flagstones, tucked it under his arm, chirped for the dog to follow him, and without a word further, trudged, with cast-down eyes, to meet the same fate as ours. The distance to the police station was soon reached, and we entered the front way, passed through to the back room, and there waited the pleasure of our captors. Two or three half-dozing men were on a wooden settee in the room. One of them rose and civilly brought a chair for Martha, who sat down. I stood with my hands on the back of the chair, not feeling very well at ease. Nathaniel rested himself on a stool nearby, and Jack, evidently aware that there was now leisure for it, stretched himself at full length on the floor and had a good time with his head between his forepaws. Chapter 18 In which is told the end of the scrape and what came to pass afterwards. New as an adventure and situation of this sort were to Martha, she stood it like a heroine. I had never seen a woman's conduct more admirable, and from that moment my attachment, for such a feeling had already taken root in my mind, was colored with an esteem and respect which made it indeed true love. Previously the sentiment had perhaps been composed more of pity and sympathy for the wrongs which were encompassing her, but the demeanor she exhibited in these incidents proved her worthy of a more solid regard and warmer friendship. Yes, it was while we were waiting there in that cheerless police room that the inspiration first came to me, of a simple way to cut the knot at once, or at any rate to remove most of the complications and make the battle between Covert and Martha a decided one. I felt, I knew, that such a girl as this I could love. Indeed, I felt that I did love her, now, and that my feeling was of that positive, real kind, equally without reserve and devoid of morbid ardor, a feeling which I divined was the best and the only genuine feeling which should lead to marriage. I bethought me then, for though we waited but a few minutes, thought travels over space and time quick enough, and I bethought me of the little girl in the basement years before. I saw the scene before me, the good protectress in her plain cap and the smooth hair parted on her head. I thought of my early crony, Bill Jiggs. The good lady, ah, how gently she washed that dirty head while I held the large basin of half-warm water. How the jagged wound made me almost feel sick, although one who helped bring Bill Jiggs in pronounced it not so much after all, and laughed, and said it was more blood than anything else. How the lady looked around, and finding nothing else handy, took that famous handkerchief, so large, so fragrant, of such beautiful white linen, and bound up Bill Jiggs' phrenological developments from the public gaze. Then how the little girl Martha came and neatly tied the knot with such tender fingers, for fear she might hurt the wound. Even then, did she not exhibit the inward force and strength of her character? Wouldn't almost any other little girl have been frightened and held back in alarm? And thus and so, under a semi-arrest, and not knowing but what we would have to pass the night in durance, was determined the love of Jack Engel. In a few minutes the man who had brought us hither came up to us and asked for the bundle. He wished to take it away. "'To that I must object,' said Martha, turning to him, "'and I do not know if thee has any right to do so.' 
Martha was a different person to deal with from the boy Nat, and the officer felt it. "'Then let the boy bring the things,' said he, "'and all of you come in here.' We followed him into an adjoining room. At a little wooden table there was seated the captain of the district. The moment I saw him I felt relieved, for he was an old acquaintance of Ephraim Foster's, and besides, he and I knew each other well. Although older than I, he was yet a young man, and we had spent many months in the same studies at the public school. "'What, Jack Angle!' he cried, looking up, and then turning to the man who had brought us in. "'Oh, Jones, your trouble is all for nothing. These people cannot possibly be anything to that affair.' "'Well, if you know them,' answered Jones, "'that's enough, of course.' The officer, in a civil tone, but without showing any vexation or disappointment, asked our excuses, said that the captain would tell us why he had been so particular, and then left the room. My school friend good-naturedly rose, and pushing his seat along to Martha, informed me how there had been a good deal of serious pilfering in that neighborhood, that, from information obtained by the officers, he supposed a still more daring robbery was on foot that very night, and that a female was concerned with the parties in it. Their information was not exact enough to point them specifically to the premises endangered, nor to the thieves, but they were more than usually on the lookout. Under such circumstances, we happened to fall in the way of one of the most vigilant of the officers. The captain hoped we would have philosophy enough to overlook the annoyance. Martha's now cheerful face assured him that there was no great harm done. Truly, that face alone was enough for a passport of honesty through all the police stations of the land. Steady young man as my friend had reason, I hope, to set me down for, from all he knew of my past life, one look at the aforesaid face was enough to reassure him against any suspicions from our situation. For, although we were cleared of any darker imputation, there was something that might be supposed worth elucidating in being out at this hour of the night, or rather morning, scudding rapidly through the streets with a woman, a bundle, a boy, and a dog. But the captain did not by word of mouth ask any explanation, and as I did not think the real circumstances fitting to a voluntary recital of the facts, I bid him good night, and we departed. We soon reached the wharf, where Tom Peterson was on the alert for us. Nat's boat had not been disturbed, and I helped Martha down into it, and laid my overcoat over the seat for her to sit on. Jack entered with a bound after Nathaniel sprang in, and with a push from Tom off the pier we were afloat. Then I felt relieved indeed. It seemed to me that we were now free from Covert's more direct machinations at all events— he might plot as much as he liked, but his presence and the sound of his voice could not trouble us more. Martha, too, entered into these feelings. She had suffered much from her situation in Covert's house after his wife's death, although her simplicity and vigor of mind had shielded her from things that would have been sore trials to ordinary girls. Within the past few weeks in particular, she had found growing up in her mind a settled repugnance to the lawyer. Her sentiment towards him during the lifetime of his wife had been one more deserving to be called indifference than anything else. She did not particularly dislike, but at the same time she had no attachment, and nothing more than a very ordinary respect for him. Since the developments of late, as was to be expected, she could no longer occupy a neutral position." Her character had a good deal of strong impulse in it, and this was directed in a manner anything but favorable toward her legal adviser and hitherto controller. We rowed out in the river, I pulling on one side, Tom's oar on the other, and Nat acting as steersman. Jack was at the prow with his nose elevated and making quite a figurehead for our little craft. Martha looked upward at the sky and evidently enjoyed the whole scene. Though there was no moon, the stars were shining bright. The fresh south breeze came pleasantly up from the narrows. The water dashed in ripples against our boat, 
and altogether it was indeed a soothing and refreshing half-hour, after the hurry of Martha's escape and the stoppage at the police-house. Out in the middle of the river we lay on our oars a few minutes, and enjoyed the scene still more. The long stretch of the city's shores were silent and hushed. Two or three sloops, at various distances on the river, moved along, their white sails showing like great river ghosts, and not a harsh sound was to be heard. The Hoboken shore, too, was solitary and still. As we neared it, the just-risen moon showed out from a cloud, and scattered a flood of light on the wooded banks, the water, and everything else. It seemed like a good omen, and, indeed, could hardly help having that effect on us all. The river up above, which had seemed like a path of darkness and doubt, was now sparkling. The sails of the sloops looked like things of real life again, and the round heights of Weecocken had their somber shadows touched up into varied gray and dark green. From a war vessel lying off Castle Garden came the sounds of bells striking the time and the sonorous voice of the watch. We stepped ashore, full of spirits, and with the young blood in us aroused to the vigor of renewed life and hope and action. Tom and Nat tied the boat, and the latter took his bundle again, while the former remained until our return. Jack coursed to and fro like a mad creature. A good walk brought us, not at all tired, to Inez Cottage. She was up and expecting us. She kissed Martha on the cheek and welcomed her warmly. Our troubles and adventures were over for that night, at any rate, for, though Tom and I had to row back home, and had a good time in so doing, we hardly spoke a word, and met with nothing worth mentioning. I had hardly got in bed when I heard the advance movements of Ephraim, who was an early riser. End of chapter 18